meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council Finance Committee will now come to order. Seeing no members of the public here today, I will close public comment without having opened it. Mr. Samario. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So two items on the agenda today. Uh, one relates to employee compensation and the other relates to a new GASB pronouncement. And if it's okay with the committee, um, the GASB item will be about five, ten, min ten minutes probably. we we'll start with that. Of course. That we can sort of leave it open for the other part. So um, I want to just talk real quickly about sort of as a background what GASB is and, you know, what, what, why they exist and the like. GASB is an organization that essentially establishes financial and reporting financial reporting and accounting standards for local governments and state governments. They've been around probably 30 years. They were preceded by an organization called the NCGA, the National Committee on Governmental Accounting that, were, that started back in the 40s. But there's always been this organization that provides guidance and, and establishes standards for how state and local governments um, pre prepare their financial statements and report that information. Um, GASB, um, in the last 15, 20 years has issued many pronouncements. Every year they issue something. Um, I think sometimes it's just a matter of justifying their existence because they range from very arcane to very substantial. Ten years ago, Statement 34 was very, very, uh, was a big change in how we do, uh, we do business and how we report our information. Uh, that was sort of the Mount Everest of, of pronouncements. I would say that this one here, Gazi 54, is more like a Carrillo Hill. It's a very, very, really small item, just a refinement to financial reporting, but nonetheless, it's something we have to abide by, and it does require that we establish a, a policy by council um, for uh, related to fund balance. So, with that background, I wanted just to go over what that is. So GASB statement number 54 re relates to the classification of fund balance in our financial report, our CAFR. And I know this sounds silly, but just to define what fund balance is in, in, in accounting terms, it's your net assets or assets minus liabilities, that equals fund balance. Uh, other definitions that are more layman's, in more layman's terms, it's just accumulated savings in a particular fund like in our general fund. Surpluses over the years will eventually cu accumulate reserves or fund balance and it, again derived from revenues exceeding expenditures in any given year. And, and from a, I guess from a council's perspective, it's really what's available for appropriation before certain adjustments that we make um, to spend in addition to just our ongoing revenues. So it's, if you ever want to supplement your ongoing revenues with, with one-time money, that's what those funds come from or are for, for usually for one-time costs. Um, historically or in the past, prior to the Gatsby Statement number 54, we have classified fund balance in our, in our CAFR. We've had three classifications. Um, one is, um, let me back up, how and why they're classified, they're classified. It's really to demonstrate in the CAFR the various levels of restrictions to those fund balance numbers or reserves. Um, in a CAFR, as you know, in our fund balances, we have external and, and in, external and internal restrictions, and we, we report those. And the purpose for that is um, oftentimes if you just report one number, it's like a fund balance number, it could be misleading because you could show $30 million of fund balance and your financial position therefore would look really good. But if 95% if of that is restricted, then really it's, it changes the, the picture of what your financial position is. So that's really the purpose of, of, of classifying fund balance. So Statement 54 replaces three existing classifications with five new ones, and they're intended to provide um, added clarity and, and refinement to the, to the levels and types of restrictions of fund balance. Um, again, it's really considered a minor change in financial, financial reporting, but something we still have to do. So the old classifications were three, um, and even though you may not have heard these, these terms before, they, they are and have been presented in our CAFR every year. The first is reserved, and within the reserved classification, there are two components. One is what we consider non-spendable, and this is a little more obscure, but if we have, for example, a, a receivable, long-term receivable, we have the under the MLAP program, we have receivables from other funds. Those are assets that are part of our fund balance, but they're not 
available to spend today or tomorrow because they're long term in nature we won't get repayment for those for over you know right away it'll be multiple years so we set aside that as a reserve of fund balance as being unavailable or not spendable for, for appropriation it also includes uh, um, amounts that are contractually obligated classic examples of those are, are purchase orders or contracts that we have outstanding in a given year we set aside or reserve those funds then there's the unreserved but designated portions of fund balance, and that's really what council has established as being a, a set aside for a specific purpose. Um, we have a policy now that establishes disaster reserves, contingency reserves, and in enterprise funds, capital reserves, and that's a, a classic example of a designated portion of fund balance. It's unreserved because there's no external restrictions on that, but internally it has been designated or earmarked for a purpose. And then there's the unreserved and undesignated. That's everything else. So if it's, uh, if it's not reserved, if it's not designated, then it's just it's what's left over. And we refer to that in the past uh, or have referred to that in the past as reserves above policy. It's sort of it's extra money that we can appropriate for any purpose. So again, the, the five new classifications are intended to, to provide better clarity as to how the, the, the fund balances have been restricted. There is what's now called a non-spendable non -spendable fund balance amount, and this is, as I said, these are for things that really aren't spendable, such as uh, inventories, because part of our assets include inventories or prepaid items, um, but the long-term receivables, those aren't spendable, so we want to classify those under the non-spendable fund balance category. It also includes amounts that are um, contractually required to be maintained, such as a trust fund. If you have trust monies where you can't spend the principal, those we would set aside as non-spendable. There's also restricted fund balance that's sort of more akin to what we used to call the reserved fund balance. So external creditors, grantors, contributors that impose some restrictions um, that would can be considered restricted fund balance. Encumbrances and contracts also would be considered restricted. And then we also have those portions that would be, that are restricted because of um, local ordinances or um, any kind of legislation. So like, for example, Measure A, the Transportation Sales Tax Fund, that would be considered uh, restricted revenues because it's restricted for a purpose. Um, transportation for Measure A and for Measure B, that's the Creeks money, that's for Creeks uh, and Water Quality Improvement Projects. So this category in the past we would have uh, considered or classified as reserved fund balance. The committed fund balance, this is what we would normally have called in the past the designated portion. This would constitute or be made up of our policy reserves, so for disasters, contingencies, no external restrictions, but they are committed by council action for a specific purpose. And so this is a new classification where those policy reserves would be uh, classified. Assigned fund balance, this is... Um, this is also amounts that are sort of committed, but but not to the level where council action has established that. The, a good example of this would be um, amounts that are reserved for carryovers. As we've talked about in the past, we have discretionary carryovers for capital projects. We carry over from one year to the next. At the end of a given year, we would show that as a reserve because it's, we have to, you know, we're setting it aside to be spent in the future, presumably in the next year. That would be considered an assigned fund balance. So. The, a good example again for us would be the portions that are reserved for carryovers or discretionary carryovers and carryovers into the next year. And then lastly, there's the unassigned fund balance. This is what we used to call the unreserved and undesignated portion. It's everything else that's not that doesn't fit in within the other one of the other four classifications. So it's just um, available reserves above policy per se. So these new classifications um, in the agenda report, there's a resolution that we're ha having or wanting to have counsel, counsel approve and adopt. Uh, this is a requirement from GAS 54 that we actually adopt these new classifications for council action. And so that's why we're here to the committee today and to council to, um, this afternoon for that purpose. Okay. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions from committee members? Ms. Maria. Thank you. So, Mr. Samario, you won't have to rearrange your CAFR uh, format, um, or w would you have to? Um, committee Member Camarillo, yes, we would have to, and we will change. Um, one of the footnotes that we have in our CAFR describes the de in detail how the fund balances are reserved or committed. 
So we'll just see instead of three different classifications, we'll have now five. But it'll be a footnote disclosure, so it'll be a minor change to our CAFR. One question. I remember you were talking about uh, minor and major GASB changes, and I remember reading earlier this year about uh, changes they're working on for uh, pension fund reporting. Is that has that happened yet? When or if or when will it take effect? Yeah, that that would be considered a, a large change. Um, it's not a Mount Everest, but it may be a Mount Whitney. It's <laughs> it's because it's going to require us. Um, and it's already been implemented, so it's just an effective date issue um, for us. It'll be effective next year, I believe, or the year after. But I think it's next year. But we'll be required to record on our books and our financial statements the unfunded liability of all of our pensions and all and. And we're already doing that for our um, post-employment benefits like retired medical. We're already doing that. But for um, pensions, it's now going to be required. So if you can imagine, and we're going to be talking about that later today at council, you know, what our unfunded liabilities are and to have to book that and present that on our cap or on the face, on the, on the balance sheet essentially as a liability, uh, that's going to be a big, big item. It's going to it's going to create um, or change balance sheets that look really good to, to making them look really bad because all of a sudden we're going to have this huge liability with no assets associated with that. So that is a big change. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If there are no further questions. Oh, do we need to make a motion on this? Yeah. If you could um, recommend um, forwarding this to council for approval. Okay. I would so move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next item. Okay, um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit more about compensation. We had in 2010 a comprehensive overview of compensation, um, but there has been some interest from committee members in having a further discussion about compensation, maybe getting a little bit more into overall costs. So uh, that's what I'm here to do today. And um, I'm here, Barbara Barker is here, uh, and Barbara can help answer any questions that you might have. Um, so I want to talk first about some of the compensation documents we have. I gave you. Um, some handouts, um, also major categories of compensation and their costs, and I want to go through each of those major categories and give you a little bit more background on them. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, in some examples of employee compensation costs and how that looks. I uh, want to talk a little bit about some variable city costs that we have because there are costs um, that uh, um, we attempt to predict but um, can vary from year to year, and I'll go over some of the elements of that. And then just ask you for some suggestions in helping make our, make our compensation structure more understandable to council members and the public. So the overall compens, we've got more than uh, 1,000 full-time employees in the city and several hundred other uh, part-time employees and hourly employees. Um, and our compensation system, like any big employer, is quite complicated. Um, but we have been making an effort over the last several years, even predating the Bell era, City of Bell era, to try and make um, com looking at compensation, comparing compensation more um, easy to do uh, for both our council members, for the public, for other agencies. And so we have a couple of documents that do that, and they're in the handout that I gave you. The first is um, the uh, salary classifications and salary ranges. This is every regular employee classification in the city, um, and it has um, the salary range assigned to it and the monthly, biweekly, and hourly salary ranges for each position in the city. And that's everyone from our general unit through uh, city administrator and city attorney. Um, and so that is the first document. It's available on the city website, always has been. Um, and so anyone can just go to the Human Resources site and take a look at the, at the salaries. Um, the newer document that we have put together within the last five years, um, w w there was, it used to be that when you wanted to find out how much someone in, in a certain bargaining unit got paid for, say, bilingual pay, you had to go into the actual labor agreement, the long uh, labor document, and look it up. Um, that was really frustrating for those of us who frequently need to know this information. And so we came up with this matrix um, that you'll see. It says the next um, 
uh, handout. And the matrix goes through each of our bargaining units, the general unit, the treatment and patrol unit, our hourly bargaining unit, those are all represented by SEIU, the police non-sworn, police sworn, firefighters, supervisors, the unrepresented managers and attorney, the police managers association, and the new fire managers association, and details all of the uh, special pays and benefits that are that beyond base salary uh, that are received by each of these groups. Um, and if you go through it, you can see it starts with just the bargaining unit info, goes on to premiums and special pays. Uh, that would be page two. It uh, goes through all, a bunch of different kinds of special pays. It uh, goes to retirement and goes through all of the retirement costs and, and uh, benefits. After retirement, it goes into uh, insurance and cafeteria plan benefits. And uh, then specific monetary allowances. And the other gray headings are the headings for each section. And then uh, time off and work schedules, so paid leave and, and for each unit. Uh, so each of those major categories is in there, and then each kind of pay or leave benefit is detailed for each of the bargaining units. So I can go down to, say, um, page, page two, right under the gray heading that says premium and special pays, and see that bilingual pay for a general unit employee is $64 biweekly. That's in the first column. And then I'll skip over to the police sworn, and you can see that bilingual pay for police sworn is $51.20 at the intermediate level, and that there's an advanced level that has $102.50 biweekly. So that is how you can not only see what a, one bargaining unit gets, but also compare across bargaining units uh, what the benefit is, what the negotiated benefit is. So this has been really helpful for us in analysis. It's been helpful for our labor unions uh, because they can take a look and see how their uh, benefits and pay stack up with the other labor unions. And for um, other agencies who are calling and uh, wanting to do salary surveys, it used to take us a lot of time to answer their questions. Now they can just really download this document and it should answer all of the questions they have. So it's been a really good document for us and it does detail anything that's in the MOU, any benefit that the city gives or special pay that the city gives is in here. So again, the major categories of compensation, and I'm going to go through each one. Uh, start with base salary, uh, of course, and that is in the salary listing. Uh, then there are some special pays uh, over and above base salary that employees can qualify for. Overtime pay. Uh, employee health and welfare benefits, and that includes uh, some of our plans have the ability to get cash in lieu of taking health and welfare benefits. Um, and I'll go through each one of these. Uh, leave without pay, uh, including our annual cash out that we give certain uh, employee groups, and then uh, the requirement for cash out at termination, which benefits we are required to cash out at termination. Uh, pension benefits and then other post-employment benefits like our sick leave conversion annuity and our retiree medical. And really all of our salaries and compensation fit into one of those big categories. So with base salaries, again, you can see that on the salary schedule, each classification in the city, each employee is assigned to a classification, and each classification in the city has an approved salary range. The employee has to be paid within that salary range. So. Um, uh, there are generally five steps. Uh, each one is a 5% increase from the last one. And so each salary range is about 21.5% uh, from bottom of the range to top of the range. And generally what happens is when we hire a new employee, they would come in at step one. Um, and then after each year of service of satisf with a satisfactory service record, uh, they would move up to the next step. And we call that a step increase. That's also called a merit increase. It's the same thing. Uh, it just means that you've, you've served a year with satisfactory service and you deserve uh, to take the next step up. So uh, after four years, you're going to be at the top step. Um, managers and supervisors have the same salary range, but they don't have steps. You can move up. Uh, the f it's not guaranteed a 5%, it could be 2%, it could be 7%, it's a little bit more flexible. But same, same concept, which is each year you're reevaluated and potentially 
uh, could get a merit increase or a step increase. Uh, but once you're at the maximum, you're at the maximum of the salary range. And the only time that after you've reached the maximum for your salary range that you would get a salary increase is when an across-the-board salary increase is approved by the city council. And that would move the entire salary range from step one would go up 2%, let's say if it were a 2% increase, step one goes up 2%, step five goes up 2%. So the whole range moves up. Also, all of the employees in the salary range move up there too. So wherever you are in the range, you're going to get that same 2% salary increase. So that's how those increases work. Base salary is the, as far as, as, as you know, base, as pay goes, it, base salary is really where the money is. Uh, most compensation is located within base salary. We ha uh, base salary citywide, uh, about $75.5 million. Um, but interestingly, when we give an increase to base salary, um, there are other benefits and pays that automatically go up. For example, a, a, a percent-based special pay. If you're a police officer and you take on certain assignments for a period of time, you can earn additional salary up to 6% above your pay. Well, because it's expressed at 6%, when I give a 6% base salary increase on the, on the schedule, it's going to also bump up that special pay, that percent-based special pay, by a similar amount. So we always track that. PERS contributions, because that's a percent-based benefit, when we give a salary increase, the cost of the PERS goes up by a similar amount. Our workers' compensation costs are the same, and our Medicare premiums, because all of those benefits, what we have to pay is based on salary. When we give a salary increase, those costs also go up. Uh, other costs that don't go up as directly but do go up, the cost of overtime. If I, uh, if I get a salary increase, then you know, it, the cost for an hour of my overtime is going to be more expensive as well. Uh, our accrued liability for sick leave banks, the cash outs, you know, every, some people carry vacation on the books, which needs to be cashed out if they terminate. When I give a salary increase, that makes that increases the value of those cash outs because they're cashed out at the salary upon termination, and then certainly certain salary based insurance costs, our life uh, life insurance and our long term disability insurance premiums are based on the salary of the employee, in some cases. So what you'll, you've seen the one percent number before, and here are uh, our current one percent numbers. Um, the 1% number is really the cost of giving a salary, a base salary increase to all employees in a bargaining unit, uh, a 1% base salary increase to all employees in the bargaining unit. So you can see general confidential uh, employees, there are 473 employees, and if I wanted to give them a 100, I mean, excuse me, a 1% salary increase, it would cost $313,361. That includes not only the actual base salary increase, but it includes the percent base special pays. If they, so for example, an engineering pay that's set at 5%, the cost of that going up would be included in that. That includes the increased cost of PERS contributions, our workers' comp, and our Medicare. So that number we use frequently in labor negotiations to express the cost of something. So for example, if, um, if I had a benefit increase that was going to cost $313,361, so a medical increase, and I said it was going to cost that amount, I might say that that's a 1% uh, cost. And what that means is it's the same cost as if we gave a 1% salary increase to everybody in the bargaining unit. So that's uh, the 1% number, and that's directly related to base salaries and the, the benefits that drive off of base salaries. So we also have certain special pays. Um, normally, we try to keep compensation within the base salary because that is uh, what people are looking at when they're coming to decide whether to work for us. So we try to keep pay in the base salary. In, in the base salary, but there are certain situations where there's a type of pay that not everyone in that classification receives, or a type of pay that's set aside for a special purpose that has a special um, uh, uh, reason for being, um, and then we'll have a special pay. So we have percent-based special pays, and again, those are the ones that we include in the 1% number, and they go up every time we give a salary increase. We have currently examples of that are our police specialty pay. Uh, police officers who take on special assignments for a period of time can earn 
two uh, percent and then up to six percent additional of above and beyond their base salary. Uh, our dispatchers can re, uh, receive an emergency medical dispatch pay if they have that certification as an emergency medical dispatcher of five percent. Our registered engineers, uh, not all of our engineers are registered with the state, but our registered engineers uh, receive an additional 5% salary. Uh, confidential pay, our confidential employees receive 2.5%. Uh, there are special assignment pays throughout the city, for example, at the waterfront. A waterfront a harbor patrol officer who takes on a certain specialty assignment uh, can earn a 2% special assignment pay, all the way up to 20% in certain uh, examples. Um, shift lead pay, this is at the fire department, for example, or at, uh, for our harbor patrol, if you're the lead officer on a shift, you can earn, uh, if you're the assigned person on a shift, you can earn an additional uh, differential above your base salary. And out of classification pay for people who are working uh, in a classification and a level of responsibility that's above their normal job. That would be a temporary increase. We also have fixed uh, special pays. Uh, we like to negotiate pays as fixed because then we can concentrate on them and they don't necessarily automatically go up every time we give a salary increase. Um, these increase only as we negotiate increases. That would be uh, bilingual Spanish pay. Most of our bargaining units, with the exception of, say, management, um, receive some sort of pay if they are uh, able to use their Spanish language skills uh, in the workplace and do actually use them. Shift differential. Uh, if our employees are working the swing shift or the graveyard shift, uh, they get a certain dollar add amount added to each hour of work uh, to compensate them for the uh, additional burden of being on the late, late shift. Standby pay uh, for being on standby during the weekend, uh, having to be ready to come back to work at any time. Callback pay, uh, when we call somebody back to work, we give them a minimum of two hours. So even if they come back for uh, a half hour, we would give them two hours of pay. Relief time pay, uh, if an uh, employee has been, is called back to work close to the start of their shift, we'll give them a little extra time off, a little extra paid time off to, um, so that they don't have to come right back and work their full shift. Uniform allowance, uh, se several of our bargaining units include a uniform allowance. Mechanics tool allowance for our motor pool folks. Vehicle allowance, certain of our executives and council members get a vehicle allowance. And then canine handler pay would be another example. The officers who uh, take care of the dogs and work with the dogs uh, at the police department um, uh, receive a special pay for that over and above their usual. So those are the major examples of special pays that we have out there. And you can see how much each of these costs us citywide. This is the fiscal year 2012 cost. Um, you can see uh, the specialty assignment pays for police officers cost quite a bit. That's up to 6% of pay, and most everyone can eventually qualify for at least some level of that. Um, fire hazardous materials pay uh, and fire lead pay are also big examples. Our specialty assignment pay at the airport and confidential pay, not as big. Uh, engineering registration pay, uh, we're paying about $56,000 a year for that and acting out of class pay. So we have about $455,000 of special pays that are included in the 1% number uh, and are percent based. And then we have the police post pay. That's our largest special pay. That's the special pay that police officers get uh, for achieving uh, peace officer standards training. That's what post stands for. Uh, Spanish language pay, you can see, is about 114000 Shift differential, about 186000 uh, standby pay, our tool allowance, only a few people get that, so it's not very much. Uniform allowances and vehicle allowances. And all of these, I'll put the note there to remind me, to, rem to, to remind you that all of these are subject to PERS contributions uh, be besides the vehicle allowance. All of those are, are we have to pay, they, they are reported to PERS as part of the employee's compensation and, and they're subject to, yeah. <laughs> Ms. Murillo has a question. Well, Ms. Schmidt, so, and that's part of CalPERS re, um, requires that yes. it's not a decision that, that we made through bargaining or? Uh, no, that's, a, that's always been a CalPERS requirement. Another question. Yeah. So somebody who works the graveyard shift, you kind of had X dollar just for people watching. Like what, to me that seems like kind of a hardship 
I like to sleep at night. But what, what kind of what do people get for working a special shift like that? Well, it varies by bargaining unit, but right. you can see that uh, for the, in the on page three of the uh, compensation matrix, it actually at the very top it actually has shift differential and shows you for each bargaining unit what they earn. So for a general employee, if they're on the swing shift, they get an additional dollar thirty-five per hour. If they're on the graveyard shift, which you know starts later in the evening and goes into the morning, um, they get two two dollars and ninety cents additional per hour for being on that shift. Um, the police, it's a, it's a bi-weekly amount, but similar concept. It's a added to your pay to acknowledge that that is a, that is a burden. Thank you. So overall, we have about $1.8 million in um, uh, uh, special pays. Not very much when you consider that the base salaries are 75 million, so it's a, it's a rather small portion of overall pay, but it is out there, and we do track it. We always cost our special base, our, uh, the increases to the percent base special pays to a labor contract when we do labor contract costing. Um, so overtime is another major area of city <laughs> compensation. Um, varies widely by department, how, how many people are eligible for more overtime. Um, certainly the fire department has a lot of overtime. The police department has a lot of overtime. Some departments allow pay only. Uh, some departments uh, allow only compensatory time, so they don't actually, uh, they don't have the money to pay people uh, overtime, so they say if you want to work beyond your hours, it's okay if you accrue some compensatory time and take it off later, but we, we're not going to pay you over and above your salary. Um, some departments budget for overtime and some don't. Uh, the departments that are the likeliest to budget for overtime are the ones that know that when somebody takes the day off, they've got to bring somebody in overtime to backfill them, such as the fire department. Uh, water, wastewater also budgets, budgets for overtime for that reason. Um, and then the likelihood of call-outs. Call we do have budgeted overtime in the streets crew because we know that there are going to be times when we're going to have to call people back to work and, and, and work them on overtime. Uh, in some cases, overtime is actually more cost-effective than hiring additional staff. Um, so even though we may have high overtime costs at the fire department, for example, it, that's actually cheaper for us to give a lot of overtime than it is if we were to hire relief um, firefighters and pay them not only salaries, but their health benefits and their PERS contributions, which are more than 40 percent. Um, so it can actually be less expensive for us to pay overtime than to hire an additional employee in that case. Um, so for example, just to show you, uh, in fiscal year 2012, we budgeted about $5 million in overtime. That was expected overtime. And we had uh, about $5.7 in actual overtime. And then we also had some comp time, compensatory time pay up outs, which are just delayed over time. They accrue them, accrue it, and then eventually we pay it out to them because they don't use it as time off. So that's overtime. Health and welfare benefits. Um, the bi major categories for health and welfare benefits where the city actually makes a contribution are medical, dental, and vision, and uh, basic life insurance and long-term disability. Uh, we also have various uh, uh, employee-paid uh, benefits that they can purchase, such as short-term disability in some cases. They also can, there's like, there's a cancer insurance uh, policy that some employees can purchase. But these are the ones that we as the city contribute to. Those are, the other ones are offered just to employees at their own cost. So for managers and supervisors, we have a straight cafeteria plan. You get an allowance and then you can use that allowance for, to purchase medical, dental, and vision. If you, ex if your purchases exceed that allowance, you pay the difference. If they don't meet that allowance, then you get the difference back in cash. That's a, what we would call a straight cafeteria plan. So, for example, there's a supervisor. The allowance toward health insurance would be a hundred and uh, I mean, a thousand and eleven a month. The employee only uses seven hundred of that toward premiums. Say they only elect their the uh, employee only insurance, then they'll get the full difference back in cash of three hundred and eleven dollars. Other um, plans that not the supervisors and the managers are hybrid cafeteria plans. And the reason we do a hybrid is because it allows us to allow some cash out, but to actually increase the amount that we're paying toward the family benefit um, by not having the full amount be, cash, be able to be cashed out. So for example, a police employee 
uh, gets up to uh, 1447 uh, per month toward family premiums. Um, with a, but they have a $500 cash out option. So they, the cash out option is less than the 1447. So if they spend $300 per month, they would get the $200 difference in cash up to the maximum cash out allowance. If they spent nothing, they would get the full 500. If they spend more than 500, they don't get the difference in cash, but they don't have to pay anything. We're, we're still going to pay up to the 1447 cap. So um, this allows us to, when we're, you know, with the other bargaining units, it's really a, uh, the straight cafeteria plan is more egalitarian. The hybrid cafeteria plan allows for greater contributions for families um, and lesser for, for cash out. So it's, not, it's less egalitarian and more focused on providing the coverage. And then we do have life insurance and long-term disability premiums paid by the city. The life insurance amounts vary from uh, $50,000 a year to one-time salary, and you can act, those are actually on the compensation matrix. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Uh, under, on page eight at the bottom, shows the life insurance amount, the basic life insurance amount that the city provides for each bargaining unit. So you can see how the compensation matrix really works to be able to, if you have a question about compensation. And then long-term disability, that's if an employee is out for longer than 90 days. We do have a plan that kicks in uh, for for a, a medical disability that kicks in and replaces part of their salary, up to 60% of their salary. So the cost of health and welfare benefits, um, we uh, pay about uh, 8600000 uh, for medical insurance. Uh, employees pay about a million. So the city is paying the, the, the greater share, the greatest share of those contributions. And that's because for most of the plans, we have a, a maximum of, say, uh, $800, and so that means that we'll co that covers everybody who has just employee coverage, covers most people who have employee plus one coverage, and then part of the family coverage. But but for the most part, um, the city is covering the, the greatest share of medical. Uh, dental, uh, city's making contributions, and vision you can see there. Cafeteria plan cash, actually quite a large percentage of people are receiving money back um, in cash rather than taking benefits through the city. And that, it, that may be because we actually require people who do, the, do cash out to show that they have other medical insurance coverage. So um, it, most of the, if somebody who's totally opting out will have coverage through a spouse or some other type of coverage. Uh, but they are cashing that amount out. Uh, Long-term disability uh, and basic life insurance. So our costs, uh, this is fiscal year 2011, I believe, is, uh, were $10.8 uh, million citywide uh, on the city side and another 1.4 million that employees are paying in for those benefits. Questions about? Right. So another area is paid time off and that is another section in the matrix. Uh, each of the categories of paid time off beginning toward the back on page. 11. Yes, 11. So that has uh, scheduling and leaves, uh, holidays, uh, vacation. So the primary purpose of, of the leaves that we provide is to provide uh, release time from work, time away from work for employees. Um, when they do use it as time away from work, there's actually no additional cost to the city other than a loss of productivity because it's, it's within the base salary. But under state law, um, when you have benefits that are paid time off benefits that are awarded on an accrual basis, such as vacation, when an employee terminates, either because they're retiring or just they're going on to greener pastures, <laughs> um, you have to pay out all of their accrued vacation time uh, that's due to them at the time that they leave. Uh, and so that's where we'll have um, uh, a hit uh, it to our uh, budget every time somebody leaves the city and we have to pay out uh, a vacation balance. Many times it's not very big, sometimes it is. Uh, the city has also negotiated with many groups an annual cash out and this is something that many other, it's not, it's not unusual for the city, other public employers do it 
It's not very common in the private sector, but we basically say if you've used about 80 hours of vacation, we'll let you cash out uh, uh, up to 100 hours from your leave banks um, and take that as cash rather than taking that as paid time off. Uh, that, and that's just a negotiated benefit. Um, when an employee is carrying a leave, ba leave banks on the books, we have an accrued liability um, that is reflected on the books. Um, that liability is currently over $6 million. So it's, it's reflected, and I, I don't know which financial report it's on. The CAFRA. It's reflected on the CAFRA. But that's just, a, it's not likely that all of our employees would terminate it once and we'd need to pay them out for this benefit. But we do reflect that, that accrued cost there. This is where our negotiated leave bank caps come in. And you've heard us talk about employees wanting to increase the cap and us saying, no, we don't want to increase the cap because we don't want to increase that accrued liability that's on the books. We negotiate these leave bank caps in order to keep control of that accrued liability. Um, and so that's why we like to negotiate those caps. I have a question. Mr. White. Um, on the first um, piece there, the annual cash out, um, is there a, are we going to hear what that number is, the annual cost of that? Yeah. Okay. We will. Okay, thank you. So here is just what you're looking for. Um, so here are the d various kinds of, of paid time off that we give our employees. Number one would be vacation, uh, and that would be uh, that is subject to cash out. So they can cash that out uh, if they if they're in a bargaining unit that has the annual cash out. Uh, they can do they can cash out vacation. Um, we are phasing that benefit out. We've got uh, managers no longer have it. Supervisors no longer have it and confidential employees no longer have it. So that number used to be, uh, and in addition, we've had all of our other bargaining units, we've um, suspended the ability to do that over the last couple of years as part of their concessions, their labor concessions. We said we don't want you cashing out uh, um, vacation over the next couple of years. So that number that you're seeing there, a vacation cash out, um, was much higher. Um, before before we, we put a hold on the cash outs, uh, and we are but we are moving to eventually get rid of, of cash outs uh, to, for most of our bargaining units. Um, vacation also needs to be paid out at termination. Um, holiday and personal leave uh, that that is not accrued, and that's the lion's share of our employees. We we grant them a certain number of holidays. Usually, it's ten holidays a year. They're legal holidays: Christmas, New Year's, and um, their personal leave, if they don't use those holidays, they don't get to cash them out when they leave. And they're not eligible to cash them out during the year either. Um, for those operations where they accrue their holiday, so they don't get to take the holiday off because they're a police officer and they don't really have, there's no holidays from policing. Um, they just accrue at a holiday bank each month. Those are ca uh, subject to cash out, both under our, our annual cash out policies and under the law of, uh, upon termination. And so you can see that was about $156,000. Um, management leave is not, not subject to annual cash out or paid out on termination. Sick leave uh, does not get, uh, is not subject to annual cash out and is not paid out on termination. We do do a conversion on retirement, which I'll talk about separately. But uh, as w if you just leave the city, even though you may have a large bank of, of accrued sick hours, you don't get a cash out for that. Um, Jury duty and bereavement leave and other types of paid as well, pay as well, uh, you do not get cashed out for. So it's really vacation and those, those operations where you have uh, an accrual base says, for your holidays. Um, PERS contribution rates, uh, you have seen these and we're going to talk more about this this afternoon. We'll talk, be doing a, a, an update to the whole, full city council on PERS. Um, but uh, uh, as you can see, um, the city pays various amounts depending on whether the employee is a, a sworn police employee, a sworn fire employee, uh, or a miscellaneous employee who's everybody else. And the costs are significantly higher, almost double uh, for a safety employee what they are for a miscellaneous employee. Um, citywide, the city's purse costs uh, are over $20 million. Um, other post-employment benefits. This is the last category of compensation. Um, the first part of that is the retiree medical contribution. Most of our 
employees, um, if they stay 15 years, will be eligible to receive uh, a contribution for each year of service toward their medical premiums uh, until they're age 65. So for example, uh, an employee who's, let's say, that is a $9 uh, uh, per month per year of service bargaining unit uh, has 20 years of service, they're going to get $180 per month toward their uh, retiree medical costs uh, from the city, uh, up to a, ma a maximum of 35 years. So about $350 is, is the general top end of these benefits. Uh, they do end at age 65, which for us has been a real uh, lifesaver with these accrued liability problems in that we have a limit to our liability, whereas a lot of these agencies where they provided lifetime retiree medical insurance are in a lot of trouble. They're having to reflect that on their, on their books and, and also are, are on the hook for those uh, costs. Uh, and finally, I want to go through the sick leave for service credit upon retirement benefit. And this, is the one, this one is confusing to people who aren't very familiar with the PERS system. Basically, what the PERS system did is they said, hey, employers, if you would like to pass a contract amendment that says that when an employee has sick leave left upon retirement, we're going to convert that sick leave to service credit so they can get additional service credit as if they worked that time um, uh, under, their, on, under their retirement formula. And the idea is that you want to encourage people not to use their sick leave. Um, and so uh, the, the PERS offers this, this contract amendment, and that's where this whole thing originated. Our fire um, employees are covered under that PERS contract amendment. And how it works is, say the employee has 1,000 hours of sick leave at the time that they retire. That converts at the conversion rate, and it's listed in here, uh, what the conversion rate is, it's 0 .004 per eight hours. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 it comes out to about half a year of service credit. So basically it's as if you worked another half year under PERS. Uh, the value of that is going to be a half a year of service credit times the final salary at retirement times the employee's benefit factor, which in this case for a safety employee is going to be 3%. They're going to get another an extra 106 dollars and 20 cents per month added to their PERS retirement. Uh, and that's how that, that benefit is calculated. And that's why it's such a strange calculation is because it's really all related back to the PERS, to the PERS uh, formula and the PERS benefit um, calculations. Um, so with other groups, um, we you, when you do a, an amendment like this, you have to do it for every employee group in, in, the, uh, in the PERS contract. And for the other groups, we have lots of employee groups. So what we did is instead we started negotiating with them that we would do, we would do the same thing, but what we do, we do the same calculation, and instead of reporting that to PERS under a contract amendment, we'd buy an annuity. So that same employee, if they were not a fire employee, if they were a police employee, we'd do the same calculation. We'd say $106.20 per month. And then we'd go out and we'd buy an annuity to pay them that $106.20 per month. Um, so we said, well, instead of doing it through PERS, we're going to do it outside of PERS, same amount, same annuity, uh, but we'll buy that for you. Um, we also allow employees, instead of, since we're going to have to purchase the annuity, if they want to take the cash value of purchasing the annuity instead, we have said you could do that instead. Um, so, but that's, so most of our other groups have this annuity that we buy for them instead of doing it through the PERS contract. Um, and what we've seen lately is that the annuities can vary significantly based on interest rates. And so right now, uh, whereas it might be, have been cheaper a couple years ago to buy a $106.20 annuity for a 53-year-old uh, fire, I uh, mean, uh, uh, police officer, it's more expensive now uh, because of the, the market for annuities. So we're seeing some higher costs right now in purchasing those annuities. Um, but uh, you could see, actually, I showed you just to give you an idea about when we do purchase an annuity, how much it costs. Um, for police safety, the average annuity cost over the last seven years has been about $43,000. So the average person who qualifies for, who ha you know, has the uh, service to, to do this and has the uh, enough um, 
sick leave banks, uh, who, who gets this benefit gets about $43,000. For non-safety employees, it's about twenty thousand dollars. So that's about that's going out the door. They're getting that lump sum. Um, the highest annuity cost, and I know we've seen this recently. These are both within the last couple of years. Um, uh, for police safety, was one hundred and twenty-two thousand, and for non-safety, was one hundred and seventeen thousand. And this really only happens when you have a employee who started working at twenty and stayed till you know late fifties and um, made their way up high into the ranks. So their salary is high, their service credit is high, um, and then they retire. Uh, that's when you're going to see the highest annuity amounts, is when you really have a long-term, highly paid employee who leaves. And, low inter and high interest rate, low interest low rate. Interest rate. Inversely and proportional. And who didn't use a lot of sick leave. Yes, I don't think one of these people was uh, ever sick a day in her 35 years of service. So. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's how that works. Any questions about that? It is a complicated formula, and it, and it has kind of a weird history, which is why it's complicated. <laughs> Mr. White? Thank you. What's the total cost to the city last, you know, last couple of years of that program? And if not now, then I'd appreciate I you. Have that. That, I have that number. Yeah. And it's going to vary from year to year depending on who retires. Yeah. But I have that number. So that's really, those are really the main categories of compensation. And really, for our employees, their compensation is going to fall you know, pretty much completely within that. So I wanted to show a couple examples. This would be an accounting assistant. Uh, she's paid at step five salary. Uh, it would be, it, be a little lower if she was at step four or step three. Um, and she earns about $53,000 in her base salary. She also gets a special pay, confidential pay in this case, the 2.5%. Uh, didn't work any overtime, uh, and uh, didn't take family medical. Uh, so instead of the city having to pay the full, the full boat for family medical here, we're only paying $620 a month for her because she's only the employee-only coverage. Uh, the city benefits when an employee comes in below the negotiated cap um, uh, on their health insurance. Uh, and then her post contributions, because she's a miscellaneous employer, about $12,000 a year. Um, other costs that are looming out there is the, uh, not not day-to-day -day costs, but she does have accrued leave. If she were to leave tomorrow and not use her time before then, uh, she has 200 hours of vacation and 50 hours of comp time that would need to be paid out to her when she leaves. Um, if she retires, if she stays for 15 years and retires for the city, not a guarantee for all employees, but if she did, We'd also uh, owe her retiree medical until she was age 65 at the rate of uh, $9.65 per month for each year she worked for the city. Uh, and then uh, sick leave conversion. She's got seven, 750 hours of sick leave that because it's more than 500 hours, she'd be able to convert that if she, if she stays till retirement. Again, any, at any time, we don't know who's going to stay for, till retirement and who's not, but. Here's an, uh, another example. This is a police sergeant, again, at step five, $114,503 uh, per year. Um, would be less if they were newer in the job. Uh, gets more special pays. You know, they get this, this job gets uh, police officer standards training, uniform allowance, bilingual pay in this particular instance. Um, Overtime, worked a lot, uh, moderate amount of overtime for police so sergeants. That's probably in the uh, upper quartile, uh, not much higher than that, though. Um, and uh, health and welfare costs, in this case, has a full family coverage. So it calls, costs the city uh, the full negotiated con maximum contribution for that. And then uh, PERS contributions. Because it's a police employee, you can see the PERS contributions are very, very high. Uh, s double what uh, the contributions would be for a miscellaneous employee in the same uh, wage category. Uh, this employee has 214 hours of vacation on the books, also has 152 hours of holiday. Again, th because these employees accrue their holiday, that needs to be cashed out on, ret um, on termination, and also has some comp time in there. Uh, retiree medical under uh, this uh, labor agreement, that would be $910 per month per year of service, and has accumulated sick leave of uh, 
uh, hours uh, that would be subject to that sick leave conversion benefit upon retirement. So two different, different employees, different compensation structure. Each employee, it's hard to say, you know, what does a, you know, fill in the blank, police officer earn? What does a accounting assistant earn? Because each employee in the same classification is going to have a different overall compensation. They're going to have a uh, different base salary based on their salary step. Uh, they may have different kinds of assignment pay. One may be getting bilingual pay, one won't. One may be getting shift differential. Uh, one may have taken on a special assignment and be getting an extra assignment pay. Uh, so employees will be paid differently in the same job based on um, just their, their own circumstance. Uh, they may have different sh insurance selections. An employee who's taking insurance at the employee only level is going to cost us less than an employee who's taking the full family, the full negotiated maximum for family insurance. And uh, overtime, some employees like to work overtime, some employees don't. Some employees work a lot of overtime. <laughs> Uh, and then the age they started work and the age they retired are really going to affect how much we pay out upon retirement. So each employee is going to have a different compensation uh, picture. I know uh, we had talked a little bit, um, uh, 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 committee member, member White had indicated an interest in talking a little bit about what are some of those variable costs where we, we, we think we know what the cost is, we've costed it to the labor agreement, but then maybe the, the cost changes for us and the city, city ends up on the hook for that cost. Um, so uh, salaries, we get both the benefit and uh, if, if the uh, salary range, the, the step where the employee is within the salary range changes, so say there's turnover and an employee comes in uh, at a lower step, uh, the city will get the benefit of having, uh, uh, from, from budgeted uh, of that lower salary. Um, PERS contributions, when we, we budget based on what we know about PERS contributions, but when PERS contributions go up, we're really on the hook for that, the employer contributions. Um, workers' compensation, carrier rate increases and decreases. We get the benefit if the rates go down. We get the additional cost if the rates go up. Um, special pay and overtime, uh, increased usage or decreased usage of a special pay or, or of overtime can increase our costs or decrease our costs. Uh, when we had the fires, we increased our overtime costs a lot. <laughs> um, medical insurance, um, if, if the employee is below, say, the, for the accounting assistant that we looked at earlier, she was taking benefits at the employee-only level, even though we've negotiated a higher cap. Um, if the employee, is, when we get a rate increase, for those employees that are still below our, our negotiated cap, we absorb the cost of that. So for example, if uh, there's a rate increase from $500 to $600 per month and the negotiated maximum is $900 per month, we're contractually uh, obligated to pay up to $900. The city is going to absorb that additional $100. On the other hand, if the employee is, is at the family rate and has uh, signed up for benefits that exceed the cap, they're going to pay the full cost of any uh, insurance increases. So if they were at 950 and the rates go up to 1050 and our negotiated maximum is 900, the employee is going to pay the whole additional $100 cost there, not the city. Um, but there are, there are cases when, when an employee is below our negotiated, our contractually uh, negotiated maximum contribution where we're going to end up absorbing uh, insurance cost increases. Also, uh, we have movement of employees from more expensive plans to less expensive plans. And when an employee moves to, say, at the employee plus one level moves to a less expensive plan, we get the benefit of that cost savings. Um, leave, ca leave cash out liability. Um, some employees save their, their, insur their vacation forever. Some employees use every, every minute of it uh, during their employment and really uh, in any year, we may get a, a slew of people who saved all their vacation or a slew of people who used it all. Uh, so that'll, then that we won't know what's coming. <laughs> and then uh, sick leave for service credit. Uh, the amount of sick leave left at retirement is a big factor, uh, but also the cost of purchasing the annuity. Uh, what the, what's the life expectancy? What level are the interest rates that are affecting that purchase cost? Those are all variable costs. So those are really, that's really where we have some variability there. Uh, we do try to cost all uh, increases. When we do a labor contract uh, increase, what we're costing is the, the change in what we're contractually obligated to pay. 
uh, in, in making the change, what are, what are the cost increases related to those changes. So it won't necessarily include, you know, if we've had increased, you know, PERS costs on the back end that we were already contractually obligated to pay for, it won't necessarily include that. Um, so in conclusion, over the last several years, we've really been making an effort to make uh, compensation both simpler, uh, trying to um, uh, focus on base salaries and, and some of the, the core pays rather than all sorts of special pays. Also easier to understand with the matrix. We've been trying to get um, information out there so people have, can better know exactly what people are being paid. Uh, but if you have any suggestions for improving uh, the council's understanding or the public's understanding of uh, employee pay, uh, please let me know. I'd be happy to, to try different things. And that's the end of my okay. presentation. Very good. Questions or comments from committee members? Mr. White? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I expect I'll um, – I, I'm not a quick study on anything, and I'm going to need a little time to absorb this uh, document. But um, – and I do have a better understanding now of, of, of the, the compensation system from this presentation. One question about the annuities, is, would there be an opportunity to – I would think that this would be a, a, a time in history, and there's not maybe the, the only time in our lifetime time in history when those annuities would be a, a bad deal for the city, they're going to be so expensive. Uh, is there a flexibility on that for not going another way, even paying the money out year by year, that, that, that $100 a month that we were talking about? That translates into a great big number uh, at this point in history. At another point in history, that's, I mean, that number is going to be a third. I could picture an annuity being virtually a third of the cost of what an annuity is today. So can you describe that a little bit? I think there are those opportunities. In fact, you, I, you may be better to answer that question. Uh, uh, I think we've done that, at least in one case, where we didn't buy the annuity. We are paying it. Yes, that's correct. We, we, only can, we only have to guarantee that in our the example that Christy had mentioned, $106.20 per month, that's what we have to guarantee as a benefit. So how we fund that is up to us. We would nor normally find annuity that, ge that generates $106 per month, and then that would satisfy our, our obligation. But we could also choose to just pay that $106 per month until the interest rates get better and then we, when the price of an annuity is better. And so we've done that before with one employee where we had a, you know, it would have cost us a lot of money to buy the annuity. Interest rates were low as they are today, not quite as low. And um, at some point we're going to just go out and purchase an annuity for the remaining obligation, but we're just paying on a monthly basis to that employee. Okay, so that, that is a, a possible strategy anyway. Okay, and then could we back up to that police sergeant's compensation slide? Just sure. As a, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, I just kind of – tried to do that in my head, but what would be the – I know that in the bargaining um, uh, meetings we've had, uh, bargaining with the, with the various uh, units, the, the, the concept of what that person, what that l employee level costs the city has been something that you've analyzed and, and come forward with. And, and it's so the total cost number, as I recall, for example, of a of – a, a proverbial generic police person was one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. That was a number that was just some, and one of the when you're trying to compare that to Ventura and the other areas. Well, so here, for example, I mean, I could do doing the math. On what is that total compensation number? I'm coming up with, you know, between and this is kind of middle mid management for. Police, right? I mean, this is the. It's the, really the supervisory level. Yes. Yeah. So this wouldn't be that generic 180 a year number. It would be the 225 or yeah. two. I, I, yeah. 232. Yeah. 232. 232. Okay. So that's the kind of thing that that I when I've been asking about this, that's the the sort of number that I'm looking for is you know what's that gross cost number uh, that we're talking about as we're as we're 
sorting our way through the bargaining situation. So that's those are the kinds of numbers that I'd be looking for. Is what's that big, big picture number? So I appreciate you trying to provide us a handle with it with this with this example. Ms. Maria, questions, comments? Thank you. My suggestion, Ms. Schmidt, would be for us to receive some of this material before we come to the meeting. Um, for instance, I mean, I'm looking at what we're looking at for the council meeting later. So I get a report, I get to read it, I get to ask questions and absorb it. But to be handed this, you know, when I come here, um, you know, I'll try to absorb it later and ask questions. Um, so I guess what I'm, it, sometimes I think maybe that's the culture of the finance committee is that we get a presentation and everything's kind of dropped on, dropped on us right when we get here. So um, you asked for suggestions. My suggestion would be to give us some information like four days ago, like we got to do it with the city council agenda items and then you know, because I, I spend the weekend studying and at thinking of questions and asking questions, and I, I did ask for something, if you could give me something, if I could have had this an hour ago, I, I, have, I would have better understanding and questions. So I'm expressing a little bit of frustration, I see. Okay. At any time, these are available online. Uh, all of them are on the public website, um, but we can always come back. If you, have, if you have questions and you decide you'd like to do some follow-up, we can always come back. I asked for information and I didn't even get a response to my email. I, I'm sorry, I haven't seen your email. Sorry, I apologize. Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just that um, my, my experience is that we have received reports like this uh, at the meeting, but that we've followed up with, with follow-up meetings and, and the ability to, to have further conversation on it. And I, I expect to, the, this is one of those instances where I've got, even though it was online, I didn't know where to look online, so I'll, I'll be looking at this and, and look forward to an opportunity to, to ask you further questions once I've uh, absorbed it. So I have a couple of simple suggestions, and that would be to alphabetize where possible. So for instance, in this first, uh, in the classification and salary ranges, almost all of those are in alphabetical order, except for general and fire, for some reason, are, are reversed. But then when we get into the, um, into the compensation matrix, I think it would be helpful if the, the columns themselves were in alphabetical order, so you know where to look for the particular unit that you're looking for. And it would probably make sense to, um, it might make sense to <coughs> alphabetize the sections as well so that people, if they know the name of the section, they know where to navigate. Yeah, thank you. Those are good suggestions. Uh, we tend to categorize them the way we think of them in, in sure. logic, but, but exactly. yeah, for, for a member of the public, it, alphabetization would certainly yeah. be easier. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, I think this is, a, you know, this is a, a very useful, very informative piece, and I think um, going back to Mr. White's point about the police sergeant example, uh, I think it's informative for people to see for instance, when you were looking at the, uh, the general unit employee, um, the compensation uh, was about 40% of salary, whereas in the police officer, the particular police officer example doesn't apply to all police officers, it was more like 100%. And it's very important, I think, for people to understand the total compensation uh, package because in the private sector, you don't always, don't often see those kinds of, uh, where compensation is such a significant portion uh, of base salary. Anyway, and if there are no further questions now, are we, do we need to do anything about this? Yes. We just listen. Okay, very good. In that case, meeting adjourned. <laughs>